So then that I can find yeah, um well thanks everybody uh good afternoon and thanks everybody from zoom that is joining us today we're very excited to share with you our results from our final custom project presentation on pathway to 100 percent renewable energy in new york electricity supply sector and uh, we appreciate the support from our professor near our advisor and here with me our team, uh, Eric, Maga, Haley, who's going to be presented today. Um, and just to give you a little bit about the what we'll be covering today, uh, going to have some overview of our project timeline and our procedure, going to discuss our energy, New York State energy landscape, uh, what are our current renewable energy challenges that we have, and then um, an overview of our policy analysis and related studies, and then the meat of our presentation is sharing with you our results uh, from the data analysis and our findings. And then what would we um what would we love to have done if we had more time for future work and then conclude with our future recommendations. So to give and put everybody into context, you can see here this is from the latest uh, IPCC report that shows that the current implementation policies won't take us to limit the warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So this is kind of what we are aiming to contribute with this policy analysis that we develop here in different scenarios. So we can actually take uh, the urgent, you know, in, in urgent and immediate action that is needed due to our climate crisis. So with that, I pass it to uh, Eric. Hi, so I'm gonna go quick run on research timeline. Uh, of our project and during our spring semester we did our research and refined our project and summer we worked on our energy policy simulator which is our software and tried to get a uh, hold of like a bunch of stakeholders for interviews and during fall semester we held interviews with our stakeholders and like try to wrap up our work writings and that's what we came up to um, going over the next slide i have hypothesis so our hypothesis is uh, our, our our quantitative analysis will identify a scenario for New York State to achieve 100% clean renewable energy uh, in its electricity supply sector by 2040. Um, business as usual will not be sufficient to meet CLCPA mandates. So our objectives is uh, to identify and evaluate pathways for New York State and policy uh, recommendation. Okay, well, next slide. I'm going to hand it to Martha. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. So, hello, everyone. So, I'm going to talk about the energy landscape, how to do the energy profile. So, the total energy consumption during 2021 was 3,500 trillion BTU. Uh, the energy received by different uh, was uh, 1,200 trillion BTU, and approximately 64% of the total energy is lost through the transmission. On the other side, we have the electric generation in 2021 was 152,000 gigawatt, uh, where, uh, where fossil fuel was produced uh, by 60% and renewable energy 29%. So this for the four main sector consuming this electricity was commercial with 49%. Residential 37, industrial 12%, and transportation only 2%. So, uh, so all these energies come from power plants. New York State has 782 power plants distributed under under state. So the majority of the plants uh, related to produce renewable energy are located in Apte and the Hudson Valley, and the majority of the plants that produce fossil fuel are located in New York City. And as the electric electrification uh, is coming, it's highly necessary to prepare the grid for the electrification to achieve the goals. So it's necessary to increase the capacity for the grid between 111 gigawatts to 125 gigawatts. So now I'm going to move to the New York State electricity grid. So due to the, the extreme weather in New York State, the forecast is different during the season. 
uh, as you can observe here in the graph during the winter time with the blue line, we have two peak demands. One's around 6 a.m. in the morning, and then the other peak is around uh, 5 p.m. at noon. However, the situation is completely different during the summertime, where the peak demand is between 6, uh, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. So, but this situation will change the future uh, with electrification, where the winter time will have uh, will, will be the season with more e electricity consumption. Uh, and I want to move to the next slide with the energy profile and a back to energy profile. So we have the quantum renewable energies in the United States. The quantum ones are hydroelectric, solar power, biomass, wind, and nuclear power, and the potential are green hydrogen, offshore wind, and biogas. So we need to know that uh, New York City is the biggest consumption of electricity. So we have commercial residential representing 86% of uh, electricity consumption during the HVAC system. So the majority of the buildings in New York City are old and not efficiency in terms of energy consumption, electricity consumption. Uh, so implementing more renewable energy or increasing the current one is not enough if the if their uh, energy efficient is low. Uh, so the best way to improve the, the building is moving to heat pumps. So the heat pump can, pro can, pro can provide heated and cooling depending on the season. So basically what the heat pump does is move the heat from one side to another side depending on the season. Uh, the technology is three times more efficient than oil field system. And there are three main types of heat pump, that geothermal, earth source, and water heater. The most common heat pump that you can see here in the city is earth source. And then I'm gonna pass to Flo, no, to Eric, that he wanna talk about the current and well energy challenges. Yeah, so some of the challenges, current uh, renewable challenges in New York State are, is, um, infrastructure so our infrastructure is not ready for to handle a large amount of renewable energy and some states what happens is some states uh, uh, have higher generation generating capacity for renewable energy but has lower energy demand so we need a lot of transmission line new transmission line that take renewable energy from one place to other like states to states and in the figure we can see in the u.s map that um, on the left left side in the US now you see the current the footprint of wind and solar uh, uh, solar plants and the blue one is uh, the blue dots are the wind plants and uh, the orange one are the solar uh, solar plants and on the right we on the right of the figure we see in the US map is the uh, what happens uh, to reach our target uh, the blue, uh, the wind and solar of 2050. So we need a lot of transmission line that connects to different states and improve our infrastructure. So dark curve, dark curve is basically uh, shows the challenges of having too many solar power, generating too many solar energy. So in the first uh, uh, first graph we see, in the first figure we see the um, total, it's a uh, energy demand, electricity demand for New York state. So this is true for most of the places. And on the second figure, we see like what happens when we, uh, when there's generation of a lot of solar energy. So we, we know that like um, solar energy is generated during the day and it peaks during the midday. So we see the demand curve here like uh, going all the way down. So what this causes is like it causes like after when the sun sets. So there's no uh, generation of solar solar energy. So what happens is that. Uh, there will be like a uh, sudden uh, high high electricity demand. So utility companies uh, will have to have ramp up the production of uh, to compensate this uh, gap. So it will it will stress the grid. And what we can do is in the third uh, third figure we see that we can store uh, energy when there is uh, maximum you know, maximum energy uh, solar energy generated during midday and use it later when electricity demand is the highest, so that flattens the curve. So electrification, as Marfa has already explained a little bit about electrification, it increases the electricity demand of demand. And 
what happens is that the rate which we generate renewable energy should cover the loss of energy generation from like old plants and also increasing demand from electrification. So that will be one of the challenges. And energy storage. So renewable energy, like we need, uh, we need uh, um, energy storage if we if we want to depend on renewable energy. So as we know that renewable energy, like you know. Solar energy only generate when uh, electricity when there's like sun and wind and wind or wind energy only generates when there's wind blowing. So we need to preserve that energy and use it um, when we need it, need it most. So we need energy storage. So investment and cost. Uh, so um, so even though the cost of solar power has been competitive with the grid, people may not have the offering money. So there's like offering money that's a challenge. And also there's soft uh, soft costs. There's permitting, financing, and installing. So they, uh, there is a lot of investment and uh, costs that needs to be taken in consideration for people to get motivated and depend on renewable energy. Going over next slide, I'm handing it to Kaylee. Thank you. Hi. So. Now we're just gonna go over some of the key policies that are helping to enable this transition to clean renewable electricity in New York State. Starting with the CLCK, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. This is going to require the unprecedented transformation of New York's electricity grid in order to achieve 70% renewable generation by 2030, zero emission electricity by 2040, and an 85% economy-wide reduction in GHG emissions by 2050. The CLCPA specifies minimum amounts of certain types of resources, including 6,000 megawatts of solar by 2025, 30,000 megawatts of storage by 2030, and 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035. Even greater quantities of other various types of renewables is going to be necessary to achieve the clean energy mandates for both 2040 and 2050. Meeting those milestones will require investment in renewable generation and storage on um, energy efficiency measures, electrification of the heating and transportation sectors, as well as the electric transmission and distribution infrastructure. So a couple other important policies. We have the Peaker Rule um, from the Department of Environmental Conservation. This was adopted at the end of 2019. And it limits nitrogen oxide emissions associated with New York State-based peaking unit generation. Um, compliance obligations are phased in between 2023 and 2025. It's anticipated to impact approximately 3,300 megawatts of electricity generation. Then we have the Accelerated Renewable Energy Growth Act of 2020. This one seeks to accelerate the siting and construction of eligible Renewable resources that calls for cost reduction studies by establishing a state office to oversee the permitting, um, permitting approvals for renewable resources larger than 25 megawatts. It is also going to establish new transmission investment priorities to help meet these goals and mandates. The New York City residual oil elimination mandate prohibited um, fuel oil number six back in 2020. And in 2025, it's going to prohibit um, fuel oil number four. So this is expected to impact nearly 3,000 megawatts of generation in New York City. Then we have Local 97. This is part of the Landmark Climate Mobilization Act. It will result in the electrification of heating and cooling in about 50,000 of the 1 million New York City buildings that are reliant on fossil fuels at this time. It's going to significantly increase the demand for electricity. Compliance began in 2024 and called for a 40% reduction as well as a 80% overall reduction by 2050. So while public policy is driving so much needed change, the retirement of fossil-based resources is currently outpacing the development of new renewable-based resources and other dispatchable um, emissions-free resources. The net effect of that is that the Reliability margins have started to thin um, starting this year, actually. So in coordinating this transition, the state is 
going to have to prioritize the resilience and reliability of our grid. And as you can see here in this image, we'll be needing um, triple today's renewable generating capacity in order to even meet the 2040 mandate. That's equivalent to approximately 111 to 124 gigawatts of new renewables. And now I'll hand it to Mako. She's going to go over some of the studies that we reviewed and help inform our report. Thank you, Kaylee. So here's a list of the few related studies we consulted. I'm not going to talk about all of them, just I'm going to do briefly with some of them. Uh, so the first one is Hong Kong uh, energy policy. So Hong Kong started to reduce between 60 to 70 percent of its carbon intensity by 2030. We did a study, did they use it the same? Uh, policy simulator than us to model it as a discarbonization scenario that will reduce a carbon emission from 37 to, to 5 million metric tons per year by 2050. And the other study is 100 clean renewable energy and storage for everything. So this study was basically that the world can be powered entirely just by wind, water, and solar improve the health, job creation, or also reduce the environmental impacts. The challenge of this idea is the, uh, the requiring significant investment in infrastructure and also the intermittency of renewable energy sources. So now I'm going to pass to Flo, then she's going to talk about the quantity of analysis, results, and findings of energy policy simulator. Great, thank you. Um, so as we saw today, um, We've been discussing about the energy landscape and policies and relevant studies, challenges of renewables. So we took all that in consideration and utilized the energy policy simulator, the version 3.43, uh, which was developed by the Energy Innovations LLC as part of the Energy Policy Solution Project. So this is a simulator that has all it was developed for US basically, uh, and it can model all these energy policies uh, impacts feasibility from the triple bottom line perspective. Um, but our focus was mostly only on the electricity supply sector. So we didn't consider the whole, the, the whole energy profile for New York State. So how we perform this analysis? Here is very um, simplified the steps that we perform. Started with, um, it's not here, but this simulator allows you to create a user so that's very good because you can save all your simulations and keep all your data. Um, then after that, you select your region. So for us, we selected New York, right? And the sector, the electricity supply sector. After that, we selected our baseline scenario to what we're going to be comparing it to. And, and then model alternative scenarios for the policies package. And then run several simulations and evaluate the results so we can draw conclusions and recommendations that we're going to discuss here. Um, so what are the simulations that we run? We run four. The first one included uh, electricity supply sector policies only. The second one added to that first one, uh, cross-sector policies. And the third and the fourth simulation included um, additional policies that will impact the electricity supply because we know that electricity supply is based on the production of the electricity and the consumption, right, the demand. So. Uh, we consider the policies that we're going to discuss in more detail in a few seconds. So here, just to give you a quick overview, our baseline scenario um, from the electricity supply sector, consider that it will reach 50% renewables by 2030 and 70% by 2050. And that represents a 12.6% reduction from the emissions. This is the whole matrix, right? Um, so just here in the table, we have these, these reductions and our last one, consider a reduction from baseline of 49.2%. Uh, and then again, here, uh, there's so many graphs and results that you can analyze and, and play with them. And, 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 and it's a lot of information, but here we just wanted to give you a quick overview of those results. So the first chart on, on the top bottom left, Order, the first one here, this is one, um, shows the overall reductions in carbon dioxide equivalents from our four simulations. The proposed simulations that we are um, selecting here and, and proposing as a result of our research is the lighted purple line and reduces the step to the whole metrics to 78.2 
million metric, metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. Uh, it's, it meets also the 40% right there, the 40% uh, below the 1990 levels uh, by 2030. Uh, but as you can see, this is the overall matrix, right? It's not just the electricity. From the electricity supply, we have our, uh, the second graph here. We achieved our 100% renewable by 2040. And we have some of the previous policies that have accelerated schedules that will achieve that. But in the, in the next one, you're gonna see that the benefits of achieving that accelerated schedule are not that money. And in and, and the third graph, you can see that um, the first two simulations, which are the bottom one, um, shows less benefits from the avoided death and climate benefits. And our proposed shows 24 billions um, that are saved from this. And then from the, what is the cost of this package? This policy package, you can see the lighted purple. This is our proposed, shows the biggest uh, savings in this. And then, so after we simulated this, we, we had the first three simulations that considered the industrial sector, but then we decided to, to um, remove those policies because we, we had less impact on those. And considering the challenges that we currently have for the renewable energies, considering the increase in the demand that we're gonna have from electricity, from the transportation sector, from the um, building sector, we modified and adjusted our policy levers and implementation schedule. So, um, we consider the efficiency too, that should be part of the, remember the electricity supply, as I explained, is two parts, right? The generation and the production, the, the, the demand. Um, also the need of, on additional transmission lines, the need of a storage. So we included all those policies, the final analysis, and, and that's how we came up with our proposed solution. So to, just to give you um, a few of snapshots of our results, again, 60% reduction, uh, the electricity consumption will be up to 204 terawatts per year um, and 100% renewable energy. And then um, the billions in savings and then avoid it and will create jobs. So here's just to show you the summary of our results from the triple bottom line principle, the impact of our proposed simulation results. And uh, for the environmental impacts, we see how, may, how much millions of metric tons we save uh, and the electricity consumption is also reduced to 204 terawatts per year. And social impacts, we have avoided deaths almost 1900 per year um, and the incidence to avoid a loss of work. And then the economical impacts, we create new jobs. Um, and also one key point here that I would like to highlight is the energy intensity per, per unit of GPD. We keep it right below from the baseline scenario. And then our other, our other simulations uh, presented a higher number. So that means that the cost of electricity producing in a, a, a accelerated schedule will have a, a higher cost. So we will have love to have more time. And this is what we would like to continue to explore like additional sectors from the policy simulator. So we can actually transition to a carbon free uh, energy for New Year's Day. And with that, I pass it to Kaylee. She's given some recommendations. Thank you, Laura. So we only pulled a few of the recommendations that we laid out in our report for New York State to keep in mind as we undergo this transition. So as we discussed with our stakeholders and subject matter experts, which included members of NOC EJ, DEP, and CUNY, and also confirmed in our research, New York State will need to continue refining its planning processes to achieve the necessary coordination of distribution, uh, local transmission, bulk power transmission, infrastructure, and renewable resource investments. This will all need to be aligned closely, both in terms of location and in-service dates with grid infrastructure investments in order to achieve the most cost-effective outcome. And looking forward over the next decade, the NYISO is forecasting a overall decrease in energy usage due to energy efficiency initiatives and increasing amounts of behind the meter solar generation. However, um, alongside that, significant load increasing impacts are expected due to the growth in electric vehicle usage, large cloud computing data centers, 
and other electrification, such as the conversion of home heating and cooling, um, water heating, and other end uses from fossil, -based, fossil fuel based systems being converted to electric systems. So as the level of renewable resource generation increases, the grid is going to need sufficient, flexible, and dispatchable resources to balance the variations in wind and solar um, outputs. Um, the integration of batteries is going to be really important there to store renewable energy for later use. And as for the CLCPA, long duration dispatchable and emission free resources will be necessary to maintain reliability and meet its various mandates. Um, those resources are not commercially available just yet, but they will be critical in maintaining um, future resilience and reliability. In addition to that, increased transmission investment is necessary throughout New York to achieve the objectives of the CLCPA. So as we know, most of nearest renewable energy capability is located upstate. And in order to bring that renewable energy to market, three new transmission projects are under construction um, through the NYISO. This is actually the largest um, transmission project that New York State has undergone in over 30 years. So it's going to be interesting to keep an eye on that. And lastly, we want to thank all of you for your time and your attention. I hope you're feeling optimistic about New York's future. I hope you learned something and we're looking forward to any questions, comments, and suggestions that you may have. Thank you. Time for some questions and discussion. Let's see, so uh, for, check the, I'm sorry. So, Go ahead. No, I just had a question. So like for the simulation, uh, where did you reference those numbers from? Like for, for your proposed simulation, mm -hmm. uh, where did you get, like, how, how did you arrive at those numbers? I guess you must have taken a reference from somewhere. Yeah, this is part of the simulator. This old data is available from USA. So the way it works, as I was telling you, we set different policy levers, and then that compiles with all the background data is a model that takes all the available data publicly for everything from New York, the whole USA. And then based on your policy levers and your schedule implementation gives you the results from the emissions and from economic, socials. And here I just give you a quick snapshot of those, but it's coming from the model and sure. available. Sure. Is, I think the levels here. Yeah, this is a few uh, summary of the levers that I have for the proposed the proposed policies in a proposed simulation. So basically, like the model itself, let's say, for example, considers clean electricity standard as 100%. So that, that, like, the percentage is based on the model. It's not, it's not something which, like, you kind of put in yourself. Like, it's not like you're saying CCS would be 20% and then CES would be 100%. Yeah. The we, we, we're saying that. You're we're saying, saying, yes. So that's what, that's my question. Yeah. Why did you assume, based on what did you assume, CCS would be 20% and the electricity standard? Based on the challenges that we have, based on the existing policies that we have in place, based on the current need and demand that we have. So basically, it's still an arbitrary number. It could be, but you, you have to have an informed decision to set the lever, right? right? That's what I said. After we refine the first the first simulation was based on our gut, right? We want to accelerate. We're so excited. We're sustainability professionals that wanted to accelerate the transition. So we max up all the levers and the implementation schedule right away. But it's not economically feasible, right? So as, as we progress in our research, we define, we see, oh, we have these challenges. We cannot transition. We need all these transmission lines. We need all this storage. It's a new infrastructure that needs to be in place. Right, and then we took all that in consideration. We consulted with uh, our stakeholders, our advisors, mm -hmm. so dramatic expert that uh, show us and, and, and guide us to see. Oh, you have to consider the peak demand, right? How are you going to respond to that? So you need you have the renewables that produce the electricity during the day for the solar panels, example. But then you you pick demand is at night. So how are you going to resolve that? So all those decisions were taken in consideration to set the levers. Right. And inform and uh, uh, other studies that were performed in other places using the same simulator were taken in consideration. A great question, thank you. Thank you. 
Um, does this also account for um, the impact generated by um, storage technology like batteries and maybe even the renewables, like like actually creating like uh, the solar panels as an environmental impact? That part, no. We didn't explore that part, the, 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 the impact of that, no. It, it, it includes the impact, the environmental impact of changing, you know, the commission and all the existing power plants from the air quality, you know, and the avoided deaths from that, the social cost of carbon, all of that, the cost of implementing that, but the, the actual cost of producing, it considered the capex and opex, right? The, the investment of that, but the environmental impact associated for the production of the raw extracted materials, not that. That would have been interesting. And the tool actually does allow you to like input your own data and bring in new things. It was just difficult for us to do that because it required like some Python knowledge. And I just have a very introductory level to that. Um, yeah. But like if you were to use this tool for any of your studies, you can actually import your own numbers if you want to. Yeah. So that's why we say we would love to explore all as a continuation of our research. So we can add even additional policies that are not considered here, right? And all, all those additional impacts. We can't see it on the screen. I don't know where it is. Yeah, just bring the arrow to the move the cursor to the right. Go all the way to the right. No. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, got it. You have it? Because you're sharing. No, I don't have it. No, there, there are those for. I don't have anything other than. I don't have a question in here. Okay. So that's on the Q and A. Yeah, the Q and A. Let's see. Can you go there? I don't know. Yeah. 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 Okay. What are the blockers that the team sees as preventing or extending meeting the goals we've outlined? Well, there is, um, as we saw some studies, right? There is, there is some challenges for the policy level, the implementation of these policies as an aggressive part of, of it. But also um, the support from the public, we need to reach out to the public a lot because there could be some resistance from the public and regarding the, some they don't want to have a solar system, a solar farm or a wind farm installed and some environmental impacts associated like they say off, on, offshore wind that could create. So it's gonna be a lot of um, discussions with the policy level and 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 the community, the public, so we can uh, make this like that something. Yeah. yeah. All right. So um, we'll move on to the next presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Just reminding everybody as we do the switchovers, or even if you just want to get up some point in stress. There's some pizza here. Help yourself. There's a gluten-free, a vegan, a couple of cheese, pepperoni, and sauce. And there's drinks. No. No, you're, 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 next. you're after this. So Miriam can share her screen. I think it's uh, sorry. It's already stopped. Yeah. No, it has. You need to stop sharing over here. Yeah. Uh, you need to shut this one down.
Yeah, I'm going to find that point and tell her about that. So, Miriam is, yeah, so maybe I say that. Yeah, number six. Yeah, number two. Yeah. So, she just. So, when is the URL? Yeah. Oh, 20. Okay. So, basically, you can. Okay, well, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. She has to earn it. So, we incorporate your comments. Okay, good. Uh, Miriam, can you share your screen? Yeah, so it's going to All right, you take care of it. What policy you found Yeah. Miriam's going to have to share her screen if she has to change herself. No, no, it's not Miriam. It's a number three. Group three, I think. You are group three, right? The group three is not. Yeah, group three. Okay, I guess you're next. Yeah, yeah, okay. sure. that, that's the story. That's the, the slide. I just say they just sent me this slide earlier. Right. But now, maybe I'm just going to have to see. I want to just have to see. I want to just have um, that's going to be tough. The only thing you can do is, uh, you want to copy some new slides? Over? I have it on um, we have to connect them to here and copy them over. Or should we email? No, just copy, just connect it over here. Okay, okay. Better than just seeing in class. 
Yeah. I'm going to give you a wave of 20 minutes and about five minutes left. Okay. Yeah. So next. Okay. So uh, where's my next? We're going to hear about. Uh, um, urban forests in New York City. Uh, another remote sensing themed project. Good evening, um, everyone. Thank you for your attention today. Leah and I will be presenting our assessment of urban forests as heat mitigators, a small project amongst um, Professor McDonald and Professor Steiner's larger project, looking at remote sensing data from NASA. I'll walk us through our agenda really briefly. We're going to look at the problem of urban heat, health effects, um, the urban heat island effect. Um, we'll look at the solution of urban forests, talk a bit about tree physiology, then get into our objectives and hypothesis, how we acquired our data, the methods and our analysis, and finally our conclusions and discussion. Uh, this topic remains important to be continue to dig into because the challenges that come with ur the urban heat island effect remain as well. Heat waves are extreme weather events that cause illnesses um, and fatalities and make people vulnerable to heat exhaustion. According to the CDC, New York State ranks fourth highest in heat-related hospitalizations, and the Bronx specifically has the second yearly highest number of hospitalizations related to breathing difficulties. These stats highlight the importance of our research. And New York City is particularly prone to hot temperatures due to um, it being an urban heat island, which means that it has a microclimate that's hotter than its rural um, surroundings. And there are a number of factors that contribute to urban heat island, but Primarily, um, impervious surfaces and lack of vegetation lead to low evaporation rates, and this in combination with buildings and transportation and materials like cement lead us to an increase in surface temperature and an increase in near surface temperatures. Of the many possible green mitigation solutions, urban forests are possibly one of them. What we know already is that trees can help mitigate urban heat. Trees specifically have a greater impact on reducing the overall land surface temperature than any other type of green space. In fact, um, one study observed 239 European cities and found that urban green spaces that did not have trees had a cooler effect, uh, had a cooling effect that was 2.4 times lower than green spaces with trees or tree matter. Um, the main reason trees are important to our conversation and to cooling is because of the evapotranspiration process, which we'll talk a little more about in a moment. Trees absorb rainfall and provide shading from the sun, and trees also help to improve air quality by absorbing carbon for energy. Evapotranspiration is quite literally the combination of the evaporation and transpiration process. Evaporation is moisture entering into the atmosphere from the soil and other surfaces. Transpiration is moisture being pulled into the atmosphere from the stomata, which are holes that open and close on leaves and trees and other plants. When the tree is responding to the climate by closing the stomata on the leaves, then trans that stops transpiration. The benefits of evapotranspiration are that it um, the tree it cools the tree itself and um, its surrounding area. Evapotranspiration is influenced by a few factors, which we'll look at later. Those are air temperature, um, humidity, precipitation, soil moisture, sunlight, um, and wind. Trees normally release 95% of the water they absorb, but plants may not transpire for several reasons. One is uh, due to high humidity when the air is saturated with water and doesn't have any more availability for more water molecules. This indicates low vapor pressure deficit. Another reason might be because there isn't enough water content to absorb and temperatures are high, and so the tree will want to conserve water. 
Trees may also not transpire when carbon levels are excessive because the stomata will not need further energy. Um, here is a good diagram from a journal trying to show how trees can be influenced by heat waves and how they might respond. What we see here are two possible scenarios we can expect based on the physiological response of the tree to its climate. Scenario A is describing what would happen if a tree closes its stomata and stop the process of transpiration in response to rising temperatures. When uh, water vapor would no longer continue to release into the atmosphere, which would decrease the tree's cooling potential and add to local temperatures. When cooling isn't happening naturally, that would redirect cooling needs to be filled by air conditioners, which would additionally increase waste. That would further contribute to temperatures increasing. And so this is describing a positive feedback loop, which amplifies the intensity of a heat wave. This is different to scenario B, where a tree responds to the heat wave by increasing transpiration, and increasing transpiration would increase the release of water vapor into the atmosphere, which in context of looking at trees as heat mitigators, increases their potential for cooling. So <clears throat> we can uh, look at land surface temperature to give us a glimpse into the feed these feedback loops in action. So here are two cross sections from the New York Botanical Gardens from August 19th. Um, the Botanical Gardens became kind of a focal point of our study. Um, these are paired with the land surface temperature readings um, Sorry, the land surface temperature readings here are paired with uh, LIDAR imagery of the same cross section. So you can see how the temperature drops as it approaches the more dense canopy in the center and then increases again as we move towards more urban landscape of buildings and roads. Oh, that's me. Um, our objectives are, <clears throat> um, are to understand the relationship between water regulation in trees, soil moisture, VPD, and the resulting cooling potential of urban forests during heat waves. Um, the second objective was to understand how the vegetation type impacts the cooling ability in, and how far into the urban um, environment that cooling ability will extend. And then um, thirdly, just kind of an overarching um, uh, objective was to consider the accessibility of this form of um, ecosystem service, this form of heat mitigation in New York City. So these are hypotheses. Um, one of them was um, to examine trees under drought like conditions. We hypothesized that trees will regulate their water use. We also hypothesize that there is a strong connection between vegetation type and temperature reduction in relation to size and rel uh, relative to edge effects. For each of these hypotheses, we are using the um, LST reported by land surface temperature reported by EcoStress, and I'm pairing it with the additional information from the tree, about the tree um, from the soil devices, weather data, as well as other open source city data sets. We will explain a little about the acquisition of that data now. Um, so EcoStress is an acronym describing this equipment out in space from NASA, which is a thermal radiometer. It was launched in June 2018 specifically to observe vegetative cover. Um, is the remote sensor. It's a sophisticated remote sensor um, that uses five spectral thermal infrared bands to detect heat. It provides up to 70 meters spatial resolution imagery. Um. From the imagery that we got from EcoStress, we performed some quality control. We assigned each image um, uh, a rating of excellent, good, or medium. These are examples of those based on the amount of imperfections or cloud cover um, that was in it. And we used only um, medium through excellence um, and did not use things we considered bad. On the next slide, we um, see <laughs> the proportions of those. Um, all four of these tiles oops, sorry, on the upper left-hand side um, cover some part of New York City. And so these um, tallies include all four of those tiles. And then we also assisted Professor Steiner in the construction and installation of xylem flux and dendrometer sensors, which measure sap flow. Those were installed in tulip, oak, and sweet gum trees along the along with soil moisture devices in the Thane family forest, which is in the New York Botanical Gardens in the Bronx. And this is considered an old growth native forest. So to address our questions of both 
vegetation type, and water use in trees during heat waves. The EcoStress data was combined with open source New York City data sets through a process of geospatial analysis, which allowed us to subset the land surface values into our designated green spaces and their surrounding buffers. With these values abstracted, we could then calculate the difference in land surface temperatures. The weather data from Mesonet and soil moisture and sap flow information was additionally used to understand how the tree, the tree water use response during summer heat waves. So this is our map of green spaces overlaid with the eco stress acquisition from June 15th. The park um, that I have zoomed in on is the New York Botanical Gardens. Our criteria for these green spaces was that they be open to the public. Um, they consist of a minimum of 45% vegetation. Um, they were all larger than 4.4 um, hectares and um, have an area to parameter ratio of at least 20 so that we could avoid parks that were extremely long and thin. Uh, next slide. From there, we added buffers, uh, one at 150 meters and then another at 300 meters so that we could have a shape to understand um, to, to calculate the space just outside the park and, and beyond. And then lastly, we added a third buffer, um, which we called our local built environment. And this was from um, 300 meters to 800 meters from the green space. And so from here, we could do our calculations to, um, to, to find the temperature reduction um, using that built environment as um, uh, so tracking that built environment from the green space and from those individual buffers. So take questions out if we. In order to contextualize the city and the urban forest, we needed to look at the climate. What we see here are trends in temperature and precipitation in the past five years um, in New York City using Mesonet data. And since 2018, it seems that the overall temperature is decreasing. Although globally temperatures were high in New York City this past year, in New York City, the months of June to September were cooler um, than its last year. This is not proof for a deviation from the normal, but it is to show how temperature trends have varied over the years. Average temperatures were in the mid seventies and total precipitation was a little higher than usual. Uh, during the summer, we identified a heat wave from July 27th to July 29th, given the advisory from New York City Emergency Management. A uh, heat wave is an event with unusually high temperatures lasting for at least two to three days. Now, Leah will show how the forest and the surrounding area experienced some of these things. Yeah, so these are the land surface temperature reductions for the Botanical Gardens and its 150 and 300 meter buffers, as well as the borough-wide borough built environment here over the course of the whole summer from June through September. But since EcoStress takes acquisitions at different times of day and land surface temperature also fluctuates at the time of day, it's most useful to look at this um, in a 24 hour series. So um, looking at it, at it by time. Um, so by doing so, we can clearly see that the land surface temperature reductions increase toward the middle of the day and decrease again towards the evening. We can also see that the daytime, um, that in the daytime, the 150 meter buffer seems to follow the reductions of the park while the 300 meter buffer appears to be influenced more by its urban surroundings. Um, we can go to that next one. And then we can expect the, the temperature reductions to follow this general curve that's been highlighted. The botanical gardens um, readings follow this curve with the exception of August 3rd and June 15, which show considerably less temperature reductions. August 3rd happens to be immediately after this July heat wave. Um, so this became kind of a focal point for our project. We were limited by um, some of the data availability um, and quality that we had, but we were able to plot captures for um, July 26th, July, uh, and July 30th, which was right, um, which were actually right before and right after the heat wave um, advisory dates, um, and August 3rd, um, and August 19th as a reference. Uh, these are temperature reductions as seen in the botanical garden. It was significant to us that August 3rd had a comparatively lower reduction uh, than July 26th through July 30th of the heat wave week. When looking at it, um, 
at, with soil moisture, it aligned uh, well uh, that there was a lack of water availability when uh, soil moisture content reduced. Looking at the meteorological data um, here, and this, sorry, give me one. Looking at the meteorological data here, we see that humidity falls after the heat wave. We also see that there is no precipitation between the 30th of July and the 3rd of August. And uh, so in a drier climate where soil moisture content has been reduced, we see that transpiration um, does decrease amongst the um, installations. And that tells us that the tree did seemingly regulate itself in response to the heat wave. If you guys are following, this, this is the meteorological data on the right and the soil moisture um, uh, data on the right and the transpiration rate on the bottom right. Um, thanks to Professor Steiner. Um, and so we, this is um, showing the midday acquisitions um, for um, from June through September, um, as Leo previously showed, um, specifically for the botanical gardens, um, to emphasize the changes in the temperature reductions. We see similarly in non-continuous canopies like St. Mary's Park um, and Woodlawn Cemetery. Looking at the meteorological data specifically for midday acquisitions, um, this was through the help of weather underground because some uh, variabilities um, weren't present um, for the mesonet data, like wind. Um, but when looking at August 3rd or June 15th specifically, the main commonality between the two dates are high temperatures and also cloud cover, as opposed to June 19th, where we see the most um, uh, temperature reduction when it was mostly sunny. We didn't have soil moisture data for most of June to look at the reduction in that context. So we'll move on to our second hypothesis, which was that there is a strong connection between vegetation type and the magnitude of temperature reduction in urban green spaces um, above a certain size relative to edge effects. So to look at this, we selected um, six parks, three that are primarily grass and shrub, and then three that are primarily canopy. And um, there, there's a small, medium, and large of each. We try to select things that had corresponding sizes. Um, so the, I know this is a very busy chart, but if you stick with me, I'll walk you through it. Um, the, uh, I just want to point out that you can see, so this is again on the 24-hour plot, we have the canopy in triangles and the grass and shrub parks in circles, and then the color corresponds to the size. So um, it gets very hairy up <laughs> a little higher, but in the bottom, we can clearly see that it's um, the most cooling is being dominated by the canopy um, in large parks. If we go over to the right, um, the ranges have been pulled out there for you. So um, in large parts, the canopy um, showed the most um, the most reductions. In the grass and shrub, um, for in the grass and shrub of the medium uh, has a, a wider range than the canopy. However, um, that's due to this one specific um, plot here. Uh, which happens to be August 3rd, the same day that we're looking at. So in the same day, just after the heat wave, the medium-sized um, grass and shrub park had greater reductions than the canopied sized, or sorry, than the medium-sized canopy park, um, which uh, uh, we don't have sap flow sensors um, in those parts to understand how those trees are responding, but it does seem to correlate with um, the response of the trees in the botanical garden on that day. Um, we can go over to the next one. Um, and then we can look at the averages 
Uh, and um, the Canopy Park showed greater averages um, for the large and medium sized green spaces. Um, the small, however, uh, you can see uh, is the reverse, but we suspect that this is due to the shape that was chosen, the, the park itself that was chosen. It's a much narrower park. Um, and so in future studies, we would recommend that the shape be considered or we could have, um, uh, we tried to take into account narrowness, but perhaps our, um, perhaps we should have been stricter about it or, <laughs> um, and so, so any, um, the main takeaways there are that both size and vegetation seem to um, impact the cooling. <laughs> so our conclusion mainly um, for our uh, initial hypothesis is that the decrease um, in land surface reduction, uh, land surface temperature reductions after the July heat wave is um, believed to be most likely impacted by the dry conditions um, as described. The land surface temperature reductions can also be impacted by the cloudier days where solar intensity is less available. In relation to climate change, um, short-term uh, extreme droughts are expected to be more frequent in the Northeast. Um, so this trend is scary. Well, something we have to adapt for, for that. Um, and for a second hypothesis, the urban forests on average show higher cooling ability than green spaces of similar size that are grass and shrub. The large canopy green space showed an average summer daytime cooling of 3.5 degrees Celsius. And the size of green space influenced cooling ability regardless of vegetation type. Um, in regards to the edge effect, we saw the most significant cooling in the 150 meter distance from the green space. Um, the average cooling was 1.66 degrees Celsius for large canopy green spaces, um, which just <clears throat> emphasizes the, the importance of the strategic use of that space um, uh, as it relates to public health and uh, ecosystem service distribution. That's it. Thank you very much. We have both time for questions to step. Yeah. So I have one question. When you were showing that slide with the, um, the transpiration and temperature reductions, I believe, I just wanted to ask you, like, what, uh, what did you what did you find was the relation between temperature reductions and transpiration based on the drought season or the rainy season through the one year period uh, or like through the period from I think June to August when there was no rains? So I believe that would result in reduced transpiration. Mm -hmm. So how did that affect? Like, was there any direct correlation with that and the temperature as well during that period? Yeah, that's exactly. Um... That's exactly what we're looking at with that August 3rd date. There was a low trans, there was um, low transpiration. It was a very dry um, moment. It was just after this heat wave before it had rained. Um, and uh, yeah, and we, we see that the, the temperature reductions are much less. Much less. Mm -hmm, yeah. Sorry, it takes a second to learn, to know how to read those charts, I know. Um, but yes, it was, um, maybe we can hold back up. What you just say? Oh, oh, yeah. Yes. Um, but maybe with the temperature reduction. Oh yeah. So this is our, this is the, the date when it's quite corresponding with August there. So you can see how the soil moisture is drying low in that moment following the heat rate. Yeah. Right. And then it rains again. So no rain and dry. Right. Yeah. And so the green lines over there, they represent reduction in temperature? Within the park. Within the park. Mm -hmm. So that's also measured during that period of 
like no rain and less transpiration, right? There's less reduction. Yeah. Yes, I have a question, but I don't know if you if you ask, if you talk about it in the presentation, but concerning the graph of the uh, temperature and precipitation, where the temperature is decreased in 2020, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there was a peak in 2020. Yeah. Yes. Uh, why there is a peak in 2020? However, it's the COVID year and the COG, for example. Uh, emission is decreased and everything is decreased. Yeah. In that year, why does it increase the temperature? Right. And this is for air temperature, not for land temperature. Like, why would you expect air temperature to decrease alongside COVID? And this is pulled from that Zanet um, average. Is there you're any saying that why why it increased in that year or? The temperature uh, and the precipitation. Well, no, precipitation in 2020 is pretty normal. So oh, I the see. temperature is high, and that was unusual. That's true. Um, we were focused on this past summer, so we didn't specifically. I mean, this is looking specifically at June through September. So um, I, I mean, there it could be that there is one particular day that's skewing it, right? Um, so you remember in 2020 when, when you were here, were you here in 2020? Was it a warm summer? Yeah. Because I, I didn't come in because I was working from home. <laughs> I was living in Connecticut. Yeah, everyone was at home. <laughs> it was very hot. I remember it was very hot. Oh, it was a hot year. It's probably easier to do that. I mean, it's been a hot year. COVID per se. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Did. Although it could be, uh, oh, it might have been less aerosol emission, less pollution. So that has been uh, uh, like more, like more sunlight, so hotter. Mm. Oh, you're saying. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so that's that's interesting. interesting. You've also seen that thing, maybe air conditioner usage, so why not? Because everyone's at home, so that adds to the oh. that place. That's uh, yeah, it's it's yeah, they did wear it, but yeah. Maybe, maybe well. increase air conditioning use because back back people are at home. Yeah, well, yeah, that's the heat island. We could wave hands about it all day. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think. Um, Is that it? Thank this, you. This um, oh, yes. Oh, sorry. So we mentioned uh, yeah. the green space is hard, right? So it's sustainability, it's the economy, the environment, and society. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you had more time or resources, what kind of research would you do on? Key ways that people in the city. Yeah. Do you want to talk about it? Okay. Um, yeah, that's definitely something that we wanted to have time to incorporate into this. Um, and you know how time just it goes. Um, so we we uh, yeah we we ended up having a lot of work just on um, understanding what was happening within the park. Um, but we could certainly. Um, one thing we wanted to do is look at um, these environmental justice um, areas. That, um, and, and in fact, we there's a new report that we're, we were hoping would be out by now, but I, I think we, we wouldn't have had time to incorporate it anyway. But the city has released um, uh, environmental justice areas based on census data. And so there are maps of those, and it would have been really great to um, see who lives within those 150 meter buffers, for example, um, and uh, and who lives outside of of them. Yeah, yeah. That's the type. I mean, that's what we were in hoping we could get to. Do you have any other suggestions? Just to see, like, uh, influencing policy, like your data is helpful to help influence policy, which helps to protect people. So it'd be interesting to see, like. Start out with Central Park or Van Gogh Park or Staten Island mm -hmm. that park. See like how it how people use the park mm -hmm. and how it helps to mitigate the environment effects. Mm -hmm. To maybe help be like, yeah, this is important. Let's fund our research. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. True. Thank you, Liam. Thank you.
Yeah, I just walk around every cord imaginable now. Just group four. Group four. Uh, yeah. Do you have a PowerPoint? No, because we can't transfer it, but I have my flat. Because it's like a camera thing. You're going to have to scroll through. Oh, yeah. Uh, you can just like check. This, this is not um, set up for that. Let's see. Yeah, we're all sorts of trouble with PD interstates now. Right. Can't make it bigger, or you gotta, you gotta, you're gonna have to navigate over here and look. You don't have it as a PD, like PowerPoint, like that. It's a no, because it's, like, it's a Canva, so it doesn't like transfer. Yeah. Well, let me see. I, I can do Microsoft. You can download it over Microsoft. Uh, oh, no, it, it and, 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 no, oh, does it? Yeah. Computer doesn't have access to it. Cosi, do you have an account here? Can you help out up here, please? Does that? Uh, yeah, I got it. I got I got it. 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 Okay, so that, 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 yeah, some of them get cut off. Yeah, this, you're going to have that trouble. Yeah, it's going to get cut off. Oh, you're just going to have to. This is the problem you're having to I think so. You're going to have to. Uh, Talk to that. I'll give you a. Oh, I'll give you a wave in twenty minutes. So you have five minutes left. All right, our next uh, next presentation here: uh, hazard mitigation planning in the Rockaways. Um, uh, I have to make you a host.
That's fine. If it's negative feedback, right. it doesn't need to be positive. It's positive pretty well. Yeah. So we just do it. No, it's in between the T. This is the good one. Again. Are you going to do it? Can you just do it from the browser? <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Well, why don't we just can you send it? That's what I'm going to try. So I'm supplying the person. Wait, give me a second. Give me the cursor. What if we do it from this? Time? It doesn't mess up with my head. Nice. Okay, so make it bigger. I just hit the square. Square. And it's gonna cut off. And then zoom in. How do I zoom in? It says plus. I see. And then you can click the three things on the yeah. side and you'll go in. Like. There we go. All right. And then we'll just scroll down. All right. You ready? Yeah. Hi, y'all. Um, my name is Julio Rivas, and this is my partner. Genesis Reyes. Um, and we, our capstone is a hazard mitigation planning um, in the Rockaways. So our project is a little different than most of y'all. So we wrote a, uh, a report for New York City Emergency Management um, uh, that's going to be part of their 2024 hazard mitigation city planning. And this one's just specific to the Rockaways. So just a little bit about our agenda. Um, we're going to get to know a little bit about NISOM, that's the acronym, Frank, which is the far uh, Rockaway um, Arvin Nonprofit Coalition, which is the nonprofit that we worked to create this report. Um, a little bit about the community profile, the natural environment, demographic, zoning, land use, about our planning process, um, the hazard identification, risk assessment, or needs assessment strategies and communications. Um, I also just want to put it out there that this will be published in New York City website. Um, so if you're interested in this, feel free to, you know, scan the QR code and learn more about our, our project. <laughs> I see someone else scan it, so I'm just going to give it a minute. <laughs> this is a direct link to our report. Yeah. So if you want to see like a comprehensive report that this presentation is based on, then you'll find it on that website. Awesome. Ooh. Can I give it another minute because I see a phone? All right. <laughs> All right. A little bit. So New York City is developing their 2024 um their 24 uh, updated uh mitigation uh, hazard mitigation plan um citywide. Um, the plan outlines specific actions and objectives that New York City can take to reduce risk. It is also a requirement for the city to be eligible for post-disaster mitigation funding from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. Um, right, resilience, a measure of the community's abilities to bounce back and learn from disaster events. Um, for those who know, the Rockaways went through Hurricane Sandy, and this was a major uh, hurricane in the community. Um, so the Rockaways are composed of experienced neighborhoods with robust community networks. It also um, is because of these networks and experience the Rockaways has been able to preserve um, in the face of disaster events. Um, two teams from City College, hey, um, have been able to present in the, the face uh, <laughs> in partnership with NISOM and the Far Rockaway uh, Arvin Nonprofit Coalition have worked to develop a hazard mitigation plan for the Rockaways. Uh, and we used a variety of tools and resources um, that aims to add to the city's continued efforts to foster resiliency and promote preparedness in the communities. Um, part of this includes a deep dive into the specific hazard effect in the Rockaways, including how it impacts um, are expected to worsen because of climate change, details on the community's most pressing events, and understanding of hazard uh, mitigation strategies currently underway, as well as action community members and individuals can take to reduce their risk. Um, and several recommendation strategies to increase the resiliency um, with potential uh, funding options. Um, and we also are gonna have some community network resources and ways that community members can stay informed. So this is a little bit about um, Frank, which is the nonprofit that we worked with. Um, this is compromises of over 20 member organizations that you can see they're all listed right there. 
Um, um, Frank is mostly concentrated on the east, but they are expanding towards the west of the peninsula. Um, and it's a unified collective that works to improve community uh, for and with youth by strengthening the Rockaways nonprofit network. A little bit about the community. Um, it's the Rockaway is a peninsula of uh, 11 mile long barrier beach that separates the Atlantic Ocean from the Jamaica Bay and parts of South Queens and Southeast Brooklyn. It is home to a lively waterfront community with a variety of housing textures. Um, over time, the peninsula has developed into a mix of lower, middle, and upper class neighborhoods. Um, in addition to the millions of visitors that flock to the peninsula throughout the year, due um, the peninsula is divided into 13 distinct neighborhoods with Broad Channel and Reese Park situated between them. Um, as you can see, those are all the different neighborhoods. And we're going to get a little bit more, a little bit more into them. Um, in terms of natural environment, like we said, you have to the south, you have the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and to the north, you have the Jamaica Bay. Um, and this is very important to the strategy of the Rockaways. Um, so the geography of the peninsula leaves exposed to the Atlantic Ocean, a source of hazard weather patterns to include, including high winds and coastal storms. Um, the shorelines that puts these communities at risk are also unmatched regarding to the recreational resources they provide to the local community in New York City as a whole. I go to Reese Beach every Saturday of the summer. So uh, the peninsula hosts many parks and beachfronts, um, including the 260-acre Jacob Reese Park um, and the decommissioned Fort Tilden military site. Um, Jacob Reese is a part of the National Park Service Gateway National Recreation Area that extends from Sandy Park in New Jersey to Breezy Point in the Rockaways. Um, so, yeah. And then we have in the North Jamaica Bay, which is one of a kind natural resource uh, providing 18,000 acre environment that supports both wildlife, uh, habitat, and recreation. Much of the bay is composed of parkland, yet there are many opportunities not only to enhance these spaces uh, to support the ecology of the bay, but also to improve public asset access while mitigating flood risk. So, there we go. A little bit about some demographics. Um, so the Rockaways is extremely uh, diverse in regards to demographic um, and it's the in the population right currently one of the main trends the rockaways the rockaways is the population increase in 2020 the population of queens community uh, district 14 which the rockaways is situated um it was 124,000 by 2021 it increased to 134 and there's still a uh, lots of different developments being built right now uh, for more affordable housing in the peninsula so it has experienced an 8% increase from 2010 to 2020, um, and this increase is above that of Queens and New York City with 7.8% and 7.7 .7 respectively, kind of close but still high. Um, the highest population density for the Rockaways exists in the eastern end of the Arvin um, and Edgemere and Far Rockaway neighborhood, so that's to the east, right, like we said. That's also where most of the density is concentrated. Um, and between 2010 and 2020, um, there was increases in Hispanic and Asian populations, while white populations declined. Um, I do want to point out some of these numbers that we found that are extremely interesting. 28% of the population is under 18, 23% of the population is under the poverty line, 18% of the population is over 65, um, and the median income is 51, and we see a distinction between the East and the West towards the east, it's more working class, lower income, higher density. On the west, single homes, higher incomes, educated, more white. So there's this really division in the peninsula. And then talking about zoning and land use, um, right? it has many different types of how, uh, zoning in the peninsula. This might change with the tax amendment, but I digress. So um, the... <laughs> Uh, the connections, I'm sorry, and then, so yeah, so you have a lot of zoning up here, which is higher density, lower density, the only connected to MTA is the A, with a shuttle that goes to Rockaway, and then there's a shuttle that goes to Rockaway Park, um, and zoning plays a crucial role in shaping the future of the peninsula, um, as the area's unique geography is vulnerable to flooding and other natural disasters. As of 2021, the Rockaways was divided into several different zoning districts, including R1 to R5B and C1-2. Um, these district, R1-2 districts have, 
has the most restrictive zoning, making up about 41% of the zoning in the area, allowing for single family homes in large lots. And then R3 and R4 districts allow for a mix of uh, single and multi-family homes, while R4 and R5 districts allow for multi-family homes and apartment buildings. Like I said, again, it's density to the east, single homes to the west. Yeah, so to create this plan, we utilize um, existing preparedness tools, uh, along with our planning skills and qualitative research to uh, better understand the community um, and help them prepare through the full cycle of hazard mitigation planning, which is seen down here at the bottom, which is hazard mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. Um, so to engage the community, we participated in monthly community meetings and events hosted by Frank. Um, our uh, planning efforts were incorporated into established meetings um, just in order to get uh, multiple opportunities for the residents uh, to, to hear from them in a familiar setting. Um, and our qualitative assessments were gathered through meeting observations, one-on-one um, -on -one interviews, um, and a survey questionnaire. So our quantitative data was gathered through academic research, uh, diving into the existing tools, and the analysis of our survey results. Um, and the main goal of this project was to establish a starting line uh, for the community network with objectives and specific actions for more safe, resilient, and sustainable rockaways. <laughs> um, so our report includes a very comprehensive um, look at each of the nine hazards that we studied for the rockaways, um, including a description of the risk uh, climate change, a way to reduce your individual risk, as, long, as well as online resources. Um, but for the sake of this presentation, I'll just be giving a really brief overview of a few of the hazards we looked into, some of the key points, and the tools that we used. Um, so for coastal erosion, we looked at the coastal erosion hazard areas in New York City, with the Rockaway shoreline facing the Atlantic Ocean um, being one of these areas. Um, and these are areas where the Department of Environmental Conservation has um, implemented regulations to reduce the risk of property damage um, to and minimize land disturbance. So one of the main points here is that there is a predicted increase in coastal erosion just due to um, the sea level rising, um, other adverse weather that's predicted to get worse, such as coastal storms. Um, and there are several initiatives to try to control the coastal erosion, which can be seen on the, on the right-hand side. Um, these are some of the initiatives they've done in the past, um, with the bottom one being the most recent. Um, so I'm going to the next one. So for coastal storms, we focus mainly on the threat of hurricanes since they're notoriously devastating to the peninsula. Um, so one of the tools that we used to gauge uh, the coastal storm risk was this National Hurricane Center storm surge predictor maps um, that have a four hurricane categories on them. Um, the areas in blue are less than three feet above ground in terms of storm surge, and it goes up to those areas in red that are about nine feet above ground um, in terms of storm surge. Um, so it's certainly a really dire outlook once you get up to the higher categories, um, just knowing that coastal storms are supposed to increase in severity and um, just increase overall in, in occurrence. Um, and of course, we also looked at the past to get some idea of what things look like with uh, previous hurricanes. So if you look at the first map here with category one, this is pretty much the same um, inundation that occurred for Hurricane Sandy. Um, and this is also in our report, so you can kind of compare the two. Um, so taking a look at Sandy, um, let's go back in. Um, it was sort of a special interest to us just because the area was really devastated and hit super hard by the storm. Um, and these are some of the images that I got from a volunteer that I spoke to. Um, they volunteered in the immediate cleanup after the storm. Um, from many of the people that we spoke to, the volunteers were really essential in the immediate response to the storm. Um, so yeah, this is some of the wreckage seen here. In the first image, you can see the boardwalk is in the middle of the street where it used to be next to the ocean. Um, so yeah, it's really, really powerful. Um, effect on the community. 
Okay, so for earthquakes, we took a look at the overall seismic risk of New York State, as well as infrastructure density, the age of the buildings, and the building types within the Rockaways. So homes that were built before 1996 did not consider any seismic code. So that means that they're especially vulnerable. And as you can see in the first map, most of the homes here were not built uh, after 1996. So they did not consider these seismic risks. Um, and then uh, taking a look at the buildings by type, um, we found out that masonry buildings have a greater risk of collapse. And so about 10% of the buildings in the Rockaways are masonry. Um, so then taking a look at extreme heat, um, one of the main things we consulted was the New York City Department of Health, uh, their heat vulnerability index. Um, so overall in the peninsula, um, just going back to the heat vulnerability index, it takes into account air conditioning access, um, green spaces, um, median income, um, as well as the surface temperature to assess the risk. And on the peninsula, it can range from three out of five to five out of five, which is most at risk. Um, and so you can see here on the westernmost end, the risk is three out of five, um, most likely due to their really high income, as you can see here. And then as you go over to the eastern side of things, they get a little bit worse. So all the way at the, the eastern side, we have Far Rockaway and Bayswater. They got a four out of five. And then once you look at the middle to eastern section, which is Rockaway Beach, Auburn, and Edgemere, they got a five out of five. So they have the most significant risks related to extreme heat. Um, so for flooding, we took we focused on three different types, coastal, tidal, and inland flooding. To determine tidal flooding, we relied on the Department of Environmental Protection stormwater scenarios. So these are the maps on the left-hand side. And uh, they mainly gave us a glimpse into the tidal flooding, which is the orange coloring you see. Um, and these are three different scenarios. The first one is the current case with the modern storm, moderate stormwater flood. Then in the middle, we have a case for 2050, still moderate stormwater. And then the worst case scenario would be an extreme stormwater flood with 2080 sea level rise. And as you can see, the bottom uh, map has indicates that there would be tidal flooding in most of the peninsula, essentially. Um, but uh, so, And there is a predicted increase in the acres in the Rockaways that are in the 100-year flood zone. It's already pretty high at 77%, but it's predicted to get 10% higher uh, towards the end of the decade at 87%. Um, and then the, bot the picture on the bottom just shows how closely a lot of the homes are to the water's edge. Okay, so for winter weather, we made sure to look at a list of when uh, include a list of winter terms just to increase awareness in the community. I'm sure a lot of us are not super aware of what the, the differences between a lot of these terms. Um, and we did find out that snowfall is actually predicted to decrease in the coming decades. Um, and although it's predicted to decrease overall, there could still be certain instances where some winters are more severe than others. So there's still a significant risk to um, residents to uh, severe winter weather. Okay, so that brings us to our needs assessment. So starting off, we took a look at um, the needs listed off by the community district and their 2023 report. And we were able to identify these three key areas where they requested um, the most assistance essentially. So infrastructure, resiliency, public health, transit. Um, and we can see things like um, these are mainly based on uh, their worry for sea level rise and climate change, as well as their worry of overcrowding just due to the affordable housing that's slated to be built there in the next five years. Um, so we have things like installing new and replacing uh, old bulkheads, raising streets, adding drainage, um, installing check valves. We also have the construction of a new trauma center, so essentially a hospital, because they only have one left in the entire peninsula, um, which certainly wouldn't, it's already overloaded, so it wouldn't be enough once new people start moving in. Um, and then as part of public health, they also want to implement a water safety and swim program just to prevent drowning incidents for school-age children, which is another concern of theirs. Um, 
And then towards the transit side, one of the main things is they want the Department of Transportation to conduct a traffic study um, just to see how the effect of the new vehicles uh, will be on the traffic as well as the evacuation of the peninsula, just because as we saw, they're kind of limited with how they can escape that area. Okay, so as part of our needs assessment, we did deploy a 19-question survey, which was hosted on Google Forms. Um, and this survey was developed by Julio and I, and it was distributed by Frank through their community network. Um, and we also hosted a MetroCard raffle at the Rockaway Youth Summit, which is an annual in-person event that's organized by Frank. Um, and that really did a lot to help incentivize some of the people that were not super interested in community resiliency. Um, so all in all, we did receive 49 responses, uh, survey responses from 49 residents of the Rockaways. Um, and to start off with these responses, we did notice, um, if you look at the top right, there's a really heavy representation towards the Eastern neighborhoods. Um, unfortunately, not too many people from the Western side um, did respond to the survey. So it's just something to kind of keep in mind, as Julio mentioned, that the Eastern side is less access to resources, um, lower income. So that will really sway some of the answers we see here. So to better understand what is the most pressing needs for the community, we asked the first three questions here. Uh, what hazards do you believe pose the greatest threat? What are the biggest issues? Um, and what hazard-related emergencies have you experienced living in the Rockaways? Um, flooding was the number one answer to all three of these. Uh, with coastal storms as a second choice, but we also saw that respondents were concerned with non-hazard related issues like lack of parking, traffic, job availability, and public transportation. Um, we also wanted to gauge uh, the perceived preparedness and perceived resilience of your community. Um, so overall, what we saw is a really positive outlook in terms of their perceived resilience um, and preparedness with most people choosing somewhat to moderately to extremely prepared and resilient. Um, so that's just an interesting take to see how they perceive themselves. Yeah. Okay. So these are just a few more interesting responses. Um, just to kind of breeze through these, most people said that they're not really prepared because they don't have any emergency kits available. Uh, already prepared for themselves. They don't have any flood insurance. Well, most people said that. And um, although they did mention this, they do have uh, access to sources of information. Um, however, when we asked what zone, evacuation zone they resided in, only 26% of people indicated that they knew the correct zone, which is zone one. Um, but most people saying they didn't know, which is definitely worrying, uh, indicates the need for more education. Uh, and then the last one here is just asking how they prefer to receive emergency messaging and the top two we got was text message and email. Okay, so um, these are just the responses we received when asking what resources would be most helpful to the community. Um, they were gathered from the survey, follow-up interviews, and live meeting responses that we jot jotted down. Um, they mostly highlight a need for backup communications, resiliency infrastructure, educational campaigns um, to prepare and empower the residents. Um, so that's really more mainly what we see here, it's just people asking for more preparedness and more education programs. All right, so some current strategies, we're going to go through these really quickly. Um, these are some of the strategies that the city is implementing. Um, some of these are citywide. I do want to go ahead and point this out. This is basically in Edgemere. It's one of the uh, development uh, projects that came out of Hurricane Sandy that's going to be able to build affordable housing that will be able to withstand a Hurricane Sandy type storm in the future. Um, and these are some of the recommended strategies that our team um, proposed. So one of them is in increasing the green spaces, such as not a wa natural water absor uh, absorption, stormwater management, urban heat island effect, so more green spaces, right? And cooling buildings with rooftop gardens and that sort of thing. Um, we also proposed um, changes to uh, homes, so uh, you know, elevating homes, um, to making them more storm uh, resistant, um, so that type of like uh, increasing the foundation of 
the houses, right? Uh, putting, making sure your windows can resist wind and, uh, and then just regular maintenance, right? That goes a long way. So folks, you know, check in how your house is, is really important um, in the Rockaways. Other things that we propose is, um, is preserving and restoring the wetlands, so like the Jamaica Bay. Um, so not only these are uh, habitat for wildlife, but they're also flood mitigation. They filter the water. Um, they're a carbon, they're considered a carbon sequestration, right? Uh, absorbing a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, and they're also help the peninsula to become resilient to sea level rise. Um, and they offer educational opportunities uh, for students and recreational activities to the residents of the Rockaways. Um, we propose more on uh, better essential services to uh, the Rockaways with better communication and coordination. I think, as Genesis said, that was always uh, one of the biggest things, people not knowing what to do in some of these situations, not having access to that information. So we propose to nice them to better communicate, um, to uh, have more emergency power for emergency shelters, right? Um, and preventing the economic loss. Like we said, the East has a lower income, median income than the West. So that's really important. And we wanted to uh, make sure that that was a priority for NYSA. Um, And then, uh, you know, preventing access, I mean, accidents, right? Making sure that people have power and they have access to the latest information. Um, and then integrating renewable energy and smart grid technology. So that's gonna help lower emission. Um, other ones for transportation is, um, Right, efficiency, evacuation, emergency service access, goods distribution, alternative transportation. It's really important. There's really not that many uh, ways to get out of the walkways. Um, more green infrastructure, equal access to these transportation systems, um, and you know some other smart transportation like real traffic monitoring, predictive analysis, um, and dynamic route optimizations to help folks in evacuation um, and increase in the electronic. Uh, electric vehicles, because this is a big car friendly area of the city. Um, real quickly, in terms of funding, um, the Rockaways is proposed. Is, I mean, New York City um, under the funding of Infrastructure Act is New York State's going to get about 36 billion out of that funding um, with an additional 1.5 billion um, earmarked for New York City. So we are getting a lot of funding through that. Um, and MTA is slated to get about $10 billion. Um, and then with the Inflation Reduction Act, there's a lot of different programs and credits that homeowners, especially in the Rockaways, these are single home families that they can take advantage of to get tax credits to make their homes more resilient. Uh, and then we just wanted to put a quick slide about communications, right? These are all the different ways that you can uh, connect to different information, right? Um, with the most reliable one being um, uh, uh, notify NYC, right, which is the official emergency notification system available in 13 languages um, in ASL, um, and this works 24-7, so this is really important. We want to make sure folks have all that information, so when there is an emergency, they have all that. And with that, thank you so much, and we hope you enjoy this. <laughs> Time for questions and discussion. So, um, given that people are concerned about their own livelihood, their like personal, perceptible, right? And then, what what's the cost of not doing anything? Uh, what would happen to that area if there was no investment? Um, would people, for example, leave? Would they, uh, I would definitely suffer uh, from what we saw with the nine hazards, the way that things are currently working. If there's no investment put in, it would cause serious issues to the people living there, um, mainly from the flooding, because that's something that people already experience day to day. And it's really only going to get worse without any investment put into that. Um, yeah. And then I think you also see. Uh, this area is an increasing population because of some of the affordable housing. So you really have a vulnerable population that during an emergency, they might not have the income to go to somewhere else. They might not have the resources to stay somewhere else. 
right? These are folks who might be living paycheck to paycheck. So it's really important that the city make these investments to make sure that the vulnerable communities have the resources, um, you know, to be able to withstand uh, any other type of hazard in the future. I can definitely speak to that question about the suffering because my neighborhood is like the southernmost peninsula of Brooklyn. Maybe yeah. some less flooding around there, but even if it rains too hard or too long, my whole basement is flooded. Blood water is super dirty, it's not sanitary, you have yeah. all stuff in it. Um, my neighbor gets so many outages because of bad yeah. weather. So this would be like even worse in the wrong way. Um, but my question is if you don't have to answer to it, but um, so like you're proposing like raising the houses and stuff. Are you gonna try or would you want like the government to fund that? Would it be subsidized? Um so yeah, there is tax credits for that. Um and you can they can apply them through different sources, right? Through the state. Um, I think the most generous tax credits are really from the from federal the two federal laws that were passed and specifically the IRA, which focuses a lot on like resiliency and single homes. And the reason one of the reasons that we made the plan is so that the community network Frank could use it to apply for funding. Yeah. Any other question? Um, in the presentation, first of all, it's more of a suggestion rather than a question. You might want to look into bracing of buildings and structures because that is what protects the building against lateral yields, such as earthquake and seismic shifting. It's very simple, yet very effective in preventing earthquake related disasters. Okay. Yes. Agreed. Great. Great presentation. Should I exit out yeah. from this doctor? The... Yeah, just go ahead. All right. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, Miriam. Miriam's going to be joining from Zoom. Oh, yeah, I'm here. Yep. you're here? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I guess you'll be presenting. Yeah. <laughs> Next, we've got quantifying reuse in New York City. Uh, Okay, I'll give you way the twenty minutes when you're five minutes in. Okay. Okay, we can start now. We good? Yeah. Oh, good evening, everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't be there tonight. So, um, our capstone project is quantifying reuse in New York City. My name is Maryam, and I'll be presenting with Emran and Shivangi. Next, please. I'm going to start with an introduction. So New York City um, residents discard 3.1 million tons of waste every year. Um, the waste characterization on the right draws attention to products that can be reused instead of being discarded, such as clothing, electronics, and other housewares. Um, reusing these products can avoid the cost of garbage collection and transportation and the associated environmental pollution. Next. So food, food waste is another major contributor of greenhouse gas emission. In the United States, almost 80 million tons of food are wasted. So if we can rescue even 30% of this, uh, we will be reducing the greenhouse gas emission by 232 million um, metric CO2 equivalent. And in New York, food represents the third largest source of emission after building and transportation. So by definition, food rescue is the process of redirecting perfectly edible food that will have otherwise gone to waste and, and give it to people who need it. Next. 
So the objective of this project is to introduce the concept of reuse and how it reduces the New York City waste, and also to encourage people to reuse and donate, and most importantly, to quantify the reuse in New York City in terms of emission factor and how we support the New York City Zero Waste Plan. Next. So what is reuse? Um, reuse is taking product that would have gone to waste and use them more than once. Um, you can even, you can do that in their current form or with few repairs. And recycling is a series of activities that includes collecting use or reuse items and turn them into new products. And that's usually done at the recycling facilities. Next. Um, so this is the this was from the DSNY um, report, the 2019 report. Um, on the right here, we can see the entities, um, the breakdown of entities engaged in reuse in New York City. So um, reuse entities can be defined as businesses or organizations that are engaged in the repair or rental of product. So 81% um, of these entities are for profit businesses and 19% was for nonprofit organizations. So that means that the reuse sector actually create jobs. So if we can see here in 2017, there were 906 entities and that number increased in 2019 to 973 businesses. Next. This is the um, 2021 DSNY report. Donate NYC is a, um, is a program funded by the Department of Sanitation to divert reusable material from landfills. So in 2021, they diverted 67 tons of material from the waste stream through donation. And we can see here that 80% of that represent food um, in tons. So this reduced the greenhouse gas emission by 163,000 metric tons or CO2 equivalent. And it was equivalent to recycling 7,000 trash bags of waste instead of sending them to landfill. Next. So here are some examples of reuse entities, the most prominent one being NYC Department of Sanitation, eCycle NYC. So DSNY runs the eCycle NYC program, which provides residents in certain areas with curbside pickups of electronics for refurbishing and reuse. Also, Best Buy has a very elaborate and well laid out program where customers can bring in old electronics for reuse and repair at their stores. Then going on to Goodwill, some Goodwill locations accept donations of working electronics for reuse and responsible upcycling. Also, there's Reuse NYC, as the name suggests. This initiative aims at promotion of reuse of various items, be it electronics, by connecting donors with organizations that can repurpose or refurbish these items. Then there's Gowanus e-waste warehouse. This is in the area of Brooklyn, NYC. It accepts e-waste from residents and businesses for proper recycling and disposal. Then we have Sure We Can. It's primarily a redemption center for cans and bottles, but it also engages in e-waste from residents and businesses for proper recycling and disposal. It also educates people on how you can reuse and connect them to connects them to other reuse entities. Next, please. So for the methodology of this project, we have analyzed NYC open data based on the entities which are actively engaged in reuse. And we have surveyed pawn shops, which deal in the reuse and repair of watches, jewelry, wall clocks, which comprise mainly of glass, plastics, and mixed metals. And 10 entities on average were questioned in total for each segment of the pawn shops and electronic stores. And we have extrapolated this data for active 520 entities, which are currently engaged in reuse and repair in New York City from what all we have gathered so far. Next, please. Okay, so the tool we use to do our calculations is called the WARM model. And it stands for the Waste Reduction Model. It was created by the EPA in 1998, and currently it's in its 15th iteration. So has, this is the 15th version of the program. And basically it calculates emission reductions and metric uh, metric tons of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent for various categories. So basically there's 60 categories that the, that you can enter in the in the warm model. And um, some of the categories are paper, food waste, um, mixed plastics, mixed metals, uh, HD, 
PE, which is high density polyethylene. And it also calculates energy saved in BTU. Another uh, instrument we use here is called the RIC, the RIC calculator. It's a reuse impact calculator. And it kind of works in tandem with the WARM model to calculate the environmental impact of different reuse activities. And it's basically, again, a database of product types uh, through Don Donate NYC. And um, it makes the, the data collection a little bit more easier to kind of uh, consume and it's more user friendly. And um, it's an estimate of, it gives an estimate of the material composition and energy savings as well, kind of similar to what Form does. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, food waste is a major contributor to green of greenhouse gas emission. So this is our estimated food rescue data in 2023 from these three non-profit organizations, City Harvest Rescue and Left Over Cuisine and Food Bank from New York City. So New York will be reducing greenhouse gas emission by 185,000 metric tons CO2 equivalent. That's and saving 651.3 million BTUs of energy. So this emission is equivalent to um, conserving 20 million gasoline of um, um, gallons of gasoline. So um, DSNY um, donate NYC po food poll role is actually uh, um, connect businesses and nonprofit organization with excess food um, to organization that can use and redistribute it. Next. So um, I, I wanted to show you the industry that I engage in we use in New York City. So we have electronics. So these entities operate a venue or website where you can repair or rent products. And we can see here, um, sec we also have secondhand dealers. Secondhand dealers include antique store, tree store, jewelry store, musical instrument, auto repair parts shops, and electronics store. So we also have pawn shop. Pawn shop usually are more associated with cash loans than with reuse, but um, we, we were able to verify that some of them actually reuse. Next. Um, so this is the, the breakdown of reuse entities in New York City by product they handle. So since the 2017 report by DSNY, um, electronics continue to dominate the reuse sector in New York City. So we have, for example, here six, um, we have 11,000 11, businesses that handle electronics. So the most, most of these entities are actually located in New York City. Next. So going to the analysis, um, this is what we have gathered for pawn shops, watches and jewelry. So these are the 10 entities question from cat jewelry and watch repair to Avital gold and platinum. So on an average, if we take their mean, we get 500, 350 items reused and repaired per year. Next, please. So the results by inputting these in the warm model would be by repairing watches, walk clocks, and jewelry in 2023 up until now. New York City has been surveyed and we are reducing GHG emissions by 582.17 MTCO2 equivalents. So this emission reduction is equivalent to 124 passenger vehicles off the roads. We are conserving uh, 6,65508 gallons of gasoline and conserving 24,257 cylinders of propane per home barbecues. That is a lot of emission saved. Next, please. So diving into the calculations, um, let's start with watches and jewelry repaired in 2023, that is uh, 53,500. And taking the mean of these 10 entities, we get 5,350. The active pawn shops in New York City with active DCA licenses are 520. So extrapolating this data, we get 2.8 million items reused by all of these entities in 2023, comprising of watches and jewelry. So we can uh, bifurcate these items by 70% of watches which are reused and by getting these as 30% of the other jewelry which has been reused or repaired. Next, please. So um, going to our normal watch, a wristwatch, the bifurcation of the items in a watch are mainly mixed metals, which is 70.8%. Now this can be stainless steel, gold, silver, aluminum, whatever. 
And then there are mis mixed plastics, which are inside the mechanisms of the watch. These constitute for 26.5% on average. And then the glass constitutes for 2.7%, uh, which is mainly aluminum oxide, the regular glass, which we use. So the number of watches which were repaired or reused were 2.6 million. The exact units are given and the total number of jewelry. So the jewelry which we were able to gather data on was purely mixed metals. We did not include other sorts of jewelry. So this came out to be 1.1 million units. And then the going on to further calculations, these were our results. Percentage of glasses and watches uh, translates to 52,580 units of glass reused or repaired. And with metals, it translates to 1.4 only regarding for watches, 1.4 million units reused and repaired. And for the percentage of plastics and watches, um, oh, 516061 units were reused and repaired. So please bear with me. I have that Indian and European system of numbers in my head, so I have a hard time. Okay, next, please. So uh, if we need to use the warm model to um, make out the results, we need to convert these units into tons. So plastic content in the watch generally weighs around 10 grams on an average. So if we convert that to kilograms, that will give us 5160 kgs. And if we convert that to tons, it becomes 5.16 tons. Next, please. So similarly with glass, glass in the watch generally weighs 100 grams on average. And if we convert it to tons, it becomes 5.3 tons. Next, please. And with mixed metals, if um, it generally weighs in a watch for around 70 grams. And if we convert that to tons, it becomes 155.2 tons. Next, please. And that was the analysis of mixed metals, plastics, and glasses which we have uh, done so far. And then coming on to electronic stores, we were able to question 10 entities again, which led to diverse items, which were reused and repaired, consisting of game cartridges, phones, tablets, computers, automobiles, air conditionings, which were reused and repaired. Next, please. Okay, so e-waste, electronic waste. So another, uh, an acronym for electronic waste is W-E-E-E, -E -E, which is Waste Electrical and Electronic Equipment. Every year, about 6.9 million tons of e-waste is created in the U.S. alone. And uh, they say by 2030, they're gonna, there's going to be 81.6 million tons globally produced of e-waste. Um, about 70% of the met heavy metals present in landfills is because of e-waste. And it's usually um, can be uh, lithium. So or lithium actually is not a heavy metal. I would say lead, mercury, cadmium, and chromium. So those are some of the... the the heavy metals present in landfills. Um, the average household, according to the CEA, the Consumer uh, Electronics Association, they say we have 28 electronic devices per household. Um, and the estimates of e-waste in New York City, this number is not correct. It's not 178,000. That should be 25,000 tons, I'm sorry. So 25,000 tons per year. And the NYC open data reports that 2,158 electronic stores are in NYC. And of them, about 1,200 offer repair and reuse. And this is just a graph of electronic waste diverted. So basically for mobile phones, we have about 7,200 uh, metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent saved by the repair and reuse of the of cell phones uh, across, uh, across the city. For computers and laptops, it's about 12,500 metric tons. And gaming consoles comes in at about 4,800 uh, metric tons. In conclusion, um, basically we want to reiterate the maximizing the useful life of products, which is the kind of the, by definition what reuse is. Um, it's important in creating city jobs. Uh, nationally, there's about 170,000 jobs that are currently reuse jobs. Um, basically, we also we wanna minimize unnecessary manufacturing by doing reuse and then um, helping manage resources that are limited, uh, especially reducing people from exploitation of rare earth uh, metals that are contained in cell phones, for example. So there's, that's a big social issue, right, in, in other countries where they're mining for these metals. Um, and also minimizing waste and contributing to the circular economy. And this is, this is all to meet the zero waste goals of New York City by 2030. Some recommendations are uh, just kind of pushing how affordable reuse is, you know, for people like rather than buying a brand new phone, showing that it's kind of cool to buy a used phone. You know, that's, it's actually, you know, and show the community that you're doing a, the, a, a greater good by buying used. Also a barter system could be another uh, way to look at things to create a community and uh, trade goods amongst people. 
And there's a community, a Facebook community called Buy Nothing, where they offer things in the city for free. You can buy, you can get things for free, or you can exchange goods with people on that uh, Facebook community. And also, again, like I said, just kind of educating the public on the environmental benefits. So maybe if you're purchasing something from somewhere that's used, you give them a little maybe pamphlet or a little report that, hey, this is how much you save from buying used compared to buying new. So that could be something. And also kind of participating in flea markets, which are kind of spread across the, the city. Um, in Jackson Heights, for example, have, there's a large flea market uh, on the weekends and a lot of different vendors are set up and that helps you know kind of promote reuse. So um, if you want to donate or find secondhand products, Donate NYC is the, is a good place to start. Um, they have tools for resident. They have tools resident can use to locate convenient place, places or to donate or find secondhand products. Also, if you are a business or organization, you can also use the Donate NYC um page, where um they 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 can also give um I'm sorry. Um, they also use it, you can use it to give or receive um, use or surplus material instead of sending all those to um, landfill. Thank you for listening. We're looking forward to questions and comments. Thank you. Okay, that leaves uh, time for discussion. Questions? Did you? Um, I'm curious about the proportion of reuse to what's going in the landfill, which of course I suppose you can't. Um, that would be a very difficult task for you to know for each of those items what's going into the landfill. Mm -hmm. But do you have or do you come across anything that? Would give a little reference for you know how much is being reused versus how much is being thrown out. You can put that slide like how much was diverted. Yeah. Um. Actually, we were um. There was a DSNY report that was supposed to come out for this year, but. Um, it didn't come out yet, so we were looking for it to maybe have it. Um, that will have entered the session good. So, but this in in twenty twenty one, this is the amount. Like this is only donate NYC with his partners, so they were able to save sixty seven tons of material. It's not it's not huge compared to the amount of waste, but it's it's a start, you know. You can put that slide, like I can explain. Which one? Um, that car and propane slide. The first slide. Right. Oh. No. Yeah. This slide. So you were asking, like, how can we tell, like, how much uh, emissions have been saved and what is not going into the landfill? So there's an analysis section tab on the worm model. If you go into it, you can input how much tons of waste which were reused or repaired. So that will give us how many uh, GHGs of emissions were reduced and M2, M2 carbon dioxide equivalents are the units. And if we run it parallel to the RIC model, it will give us BTUs of energy saved. And if you even want to like translate into more layman terms, you can tell that such such amount of emissions which were diverted will save 124 passenger vehicles off the roads. We can conserve these many gallons of gasoline or um, barbecues are known very notoriously for uh, causing air pollution. So conserving these many numbers of cylinders of propane for home barbecues. It just depends on the value and input which you put in the board model, which will tell you how much you're actually saving. I hope that answers your question. Exactly, but uh, um, <laughs> that's okay. But it is very cool that they um, they have this available and all this storage in this um, report that will come out. Yes. Um, have you considered what like the social media campaign would look like to promote the reuse, reuse, 
uh, repurposing materials. Um, I know, like, the first thing is very big on social media. So these types of things that just kind of generate interest. Um, where is Where's the ability to make it cool or make it worthwhile to people? So I can answer that question. I am currently interning for CUNY School of Public Health. Uh, I'm a food initiatives intern. So we do deal with food rescue and we do have a social media page. Uh, it's titled CUNY School of Public Health. And if you um, wanna see how we are like handling foreign rights contracts, battling food insecurity, trying to um, stalk the Benny's food can, uh, pantry at CCNY and other pantries at other CUNY campuses. And if we're having food leftovers, how we are trying to sell it off at discounts at the end of the day. Those are some initiatives. And yes, we are trying to pack our social media that way. This is not directly correlated to our capstone, but this is something I can tell you at a personal level. Any other questions, comments, discussion? Maybe the QA that is Oh, could you please uh, check the oh. questions? There's some questions in there that we missed from a prior uh, presentation. <laughs> What is the need down to sanctify my project with this product has not been designed for both easy repair and upgrade and also for easy construction and the plastic and more and this year? Can you please put it on the slide so that we can be okay? Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, it's uh what's being done to incentivize manufacturers to build products explicitly designed for both easy repair and upgrade, and also for easy extraction of the plastics, heavy metals, lithium, et cetera. So like Miriam reiterated before, we are actually waiting for the 2023 DSNY report to come out. And licenses are usually granted by doing a full analysis of whether these pawn shops or reuse and repair entities are complying to the NYC standards or not. If they're not, they will, they will get their licenses revoked. So we can give a more definite and solid answer once we get the DSNY report out. That's all I can say at the moment. Also, like a lot of the companies, they have like ESG initiatives. So they need to kind of, you know, meet and follow those. So that's kind of also, uh, you know, that that's also kind of goes along with the question that, you know, they need to be able to make things more like sustainable and and like, for example, even cell phones, for example, to, to make them modular where you don't have to replace the whole cell phone, you can replace a piece of it rather than creating a new cell phone. So, um, yeah. I think also there is a, um, a digital repair act law um, where manufacturers are, are, um, are asked to provide some tools where people can actually um, repair their phone, be able to repair their phone without needing to go to some repair shop. I don't, I'm not sure if it came out, but I know I read about that um, a few weeks ago. It's also a question, can you send some pizza via yeah. Zoom? <laughs> I don't know, if you could yeah. use that Wonka transport device, but the pizza would be very yeah. small if it got to you. I want to because I was eating the front, so I was looking at it. Okay, we have one last project presentation. Uh, the birds, avian life, New York City birds at risk. 
This is the uh, so we had a little bit of a mix up and I mixed up the mid year and then I I then the final slide was I don't know if my drive was yeah. something we could put in on Yeah, uh, the NRW and the Yeah, okay. Because I learned today that my computer does not USB anymore. So I think this has a it should be bird birds at risk final so the first one yeah sorry about that well, there's the world's smallest thumb drive. <laughs> All right, yeah, that's it. There you go. All right. Give you a, well, we have plenty of time, but just <laughs> so you know where you are if you need it, I'll wait at you for five minutes. Cool. All right. Hi, everyone. We're going to talk to you about uh, bird safe glass and avian window collisions. So, this is just kind of an overview. We'll go over background, our hypothesis research question, methods, results, conclusion, and next steps. So, we'll start with our background. In the United States, there's over a thousand species of birds. And of those species, 347 are considered endangered or uh, or threatened with the real possibility of becoming extinct. In New York State, there are 10, 10 of these species. New York City is very important because we're on the Atlantic Flyway, and we're a very important stopover point for when birds migrate. The photo on the right is actually birds that were tagged with transmitters, and they're proceeding with their migration. So that's what all those colors are, different species of birds. So we'll go into a little bit of what migration is. Migration is basically when birds go a long distance. Usually this is by, so this is by yearly. They'll migrate in the fall and they'll migrate in the spring to go to either their wintering grounds or their breeding grounds. And they do this mainly for resources. So some of the resources they might be looking for is um, suitable places to nest, or when seasonal changes happen, they're looking for uh, more food resources, which might be depleted where they are. So how do birds migrate? Um, basically, they instinctually take from seasonal cues, so light cues and temperature cues, and then their body will start putting on fat. And this fat is basically what they use to get themselves to where they're going. So when they're flying these long haul flights, they'll use those fat stores and then they'll basically go into stopover points to rest and refuel before they start going again. And um, not all birds do this. Not all birds do those really, really long flights that you see in documentaries. Some birds just do short migrations and some birds are resident birds that don't migrate at all. So you'll see those birds here year round. And then how do birds navigate when they when they migrate? So how do they know where to go? They basically um, can they have polarized vision. They can see an ultraviolet and they can position where the sun is. It's also thought that they use the stars. It is also thought that they can see or detect the magnetic fields of the earth in order to figure out where to go. The problem is 
In cities, we have so much light, it obscures their vision and they can't tell where to go. They can't see the landmarks that they would use. So they get attracted to cities and then they get lost, they get confused and that can make them prone to collisions. So in the United States and North America, even all over the world, we're having a bird crisis. If you consider since 1973, billion birds have disappeared. And um, there are many reasons for that. Habitat loss, cats, feral cats kill a large portion of birds. Chemicals, in the case of insecticides and rodenticides, and we're going to focus on collisions. So that photo to the left was one night at uh, the World Trade Center. They found all of those birds that collided with windows. So just to kind of put this into perspective, upwards towards a billion birds die yearly from collisions with glass, in, just in the United States. And upwards towards 230,000 of them are killed in New York City. Um, and then using the bird, D bird data from Audubon, this is a 78% fatality rate. Um, so basically, using the D-Bird data, we mapped basically between 2017 and 2022, the um, collisions. So each one of those dots that doesn't have a number is a singular, singular collision. Any dots with numbers are the number of collisions that are within a 700 meter radius of the epicenter of that dot. So for example, there are two here, 10 there, 82 collisions just in that one, basically it's within 700 meters of that one spot. I'm sorry, not 770. So this shows um, basically where the collisions are. A lot of them are, again, one world trade, are around the World Trade Center. There are multiple theories about why this is. One of them could just be the one li one limitation with D-Bird is it is incidental reports. These are reports that citizen scientists make when they find a collision victim. So these are probably other areas are probably underreported. It could also be uh, World Trade Center is heavily vegetated, very bright, and that it's very close to the water, which could make birds more prone to getting stuck in that area. So why do birds collide with glass? Well, we know what glass is, but glass is invisible to them. So they might see a plant within a window and they might think they could land on it. So they might collide with the window. Glass is also reflective. So they might see vegetation reflected and they think they can land on it and they could collide with the window. Um, if they collide with the window, they may not die immediately and they might be stunned and they're more prone to predation if they're just lying there. And then um, lights. So I went over a little bit earlier, but lights can trap a, can attract a bird to a city when they migrate, which without the lights, they would not have been here in the first place. Uh, um, and then territorial. So this is more so with male birds during breeding season. They see the reflection, they think it's another male bird, and then they'll fight their reflection. These encounters don't tend to be fatal. So Rebecca went over the, the bird side of the relationship between birds colliding with glass, and I'll go over the glass type part of the equation. So in New York City, there's thousands and thousands of glass panels all over the city from different facades, uh, bus shelters, and different vehicles. And each glass is unique, and it differs from manufacturer to manufacturer based on the use type of the glass itself. These are the five main types of glass that are actually used, laminated, toughened, coated, insulated, glass units, and flow glass. Based on the building type, use, the facade, and the client's wishes, also the architectural and vision of the architect, different glass types are used for because of their different glass properties, such as the transparency effects, boy, how much you can see through it, strength of the glasses. Uh, some glasses need to be stronger than others for safety reasons and transmittance is how much light is transmitted through the glass itself. The U value is the thermal transmission through the state in which heat will transfer through the glass material and the reflectivity is one 
Uh, interesting point to note that uh, reflectivity is one of the reason, major reasons why birds hit glass facades. Um, the reason why we decided to look into bird safe glass was because of local law 15, which is the bird friendly building design, which is a law that went into effect at the beginning of 2021, where new buildings and alterations have to include or when replacing exterior glazing, 90% of it needs to comply with bird friendly design. And it really accounts for if that 90% needs to be if it's 90% of the glass needs to be bird safe, if it's 75 feet off the ground and the bird friendly materials must be used on glass railings mostly anything glass in a building if it takes up a, a huge amount and there's more likely for birds to fly with it uh, so we uh we there's uh samples over there from the walker company and they we started to look into their uh, birds uh, safe glass because it was used in 181 mercer and it was a pattern design that is put on the surface of the glass so birds can actually identify it. Uh, it's bird safe glass is a way for to mitigate, mitigate bird collisions with the glass itself by just using fritted panels. And it comes in the types of fritted, acid etched, uh, ultraviolet glass or channel glass, which each one has their own properties and they this is how they really look when you see them by themselves. Uh, the cost of uh, birdseed glass is actually more expensive than normal glass, but it only, but by being more expensive, I actually looked into how much we're actually comparing birdseed glass to normal glass, and it's for every one thousand dollars spent on the development of a building, uh, three dollars and eighty cents will go to birdseed glass percentage. So it ends up being 0.31% uh, of the actual construction costs. Uh, so um, <clears throat> throughout uh, our research, uh, we have conducted um, an analysis for a bird safe uh, glass buildings. And then uh, we compare it to a few other non bird safe glass buildings that uh, have reported at least one bird strike. And those buildings uh, are monitored by the uh, New York City Audubon. And then uh, through uh, this comparison, uh, we considered the building features, surrounding factors, and the building size and height. And it's also the, uh, the building use, which play roles in the, uh, the, the bird strike. So our focus was uh, 181 Mercer Street, uh, which is one of the uh, few New York City buildings that contain a uh, um, bird safe glass. And it was designed by the architect uh, Karen Timberlake and then uh, Davis uh, Brody uh, Long. Mm -hmm. And uh, according to uh, to the building architect, the glass facade contains of uh, uh, the the building. It's a contains a perverted pattern that it's fifty percent gray color, and it was a factory applied silk screen directly to the surface number two on the on the glass. And this is an illustration of uh, what is the uh, uh, the glass that is being used in the 181 Mercer. Here we have the uh, the old buildings, where is a 181 Mercer Street is laying. Uh, this building was demolished uh, in 2016, and then uh, they uh, they uh, built a new building uh, that was shown previously. Uh, here we have a site map. That shows the building uh, location and uh, contacts with the surrounding neighborhood. It's in the uh, the blue, well, the middle of the chip right there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here we have the site map um, and of a public area. Uh, we could see that the uh, the map contained the public uh, area, the greenery surrounding the 181 Mercer Street. Um, with the which actually play uh, factors uh, in the bird uh, in the bird's habitats and make them more vulnerable to uh, collide into the building. Uh, here we have the uh, the zoning analysis, which is an official document that was obtained uh, from the New York City Department of Buildings. 
uh, showing the uh, the different sets of elevations uh, that the buildings uh, was approved for, um, which we think uh, play a factors uh, in the fly pattern of the birds uh, that could increase the uh, the bird collision into the building. Uh, and and this uh, we could see an, an uh, section view that was created by the buildings architect. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, we determined that it's it's not a, a typical New York buildings. Uh, it's a unique layout, space planning, uh, the different sets of setbacks, elements, and elevation, which is uh, in one hand play a role in the vulnerability of the build uh, the uh, the bird collision. And it also was a challenge for us uh, during the research to match uh, to match it to one of the other buildings that's uh, that's uh, being monitored by the uh, New York City Edivon, which contained membrane safe uh, glass. Okay, here uh, we have the schematic design showing the building used uh, by floor, and as well as the um, uh, the surrounding area. Uh, and then also it shows the uh, uh, the green roofs and the vegetation on the building itself, and all these factors play a huge role in in terms of the uh, the bird collision, which uh, which attract uh, the, uh, the the birds to the sides and the buildings. Mm -hmm. um, here we have the uh, list of the buildings. At the beginning of our research, uh, we have uh, created a list uh, of the buildings that's being monitored by the New York City Audubon uh, for the bird strikes. And uh, we conducted an analysis um, for, uh, for all these buildings, as well as 181 Mercer Street. Uh, and we consider the, uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, the several aspects that play the, the roles, uh, the big roles in the bird collision, such as the building heights, building size, surrounding factors, and how close the buildings to the water and then the uh, use of, of the these buildings. <laughs> uh, here we narrowed the, down the list uh, to the buildings that uh, have at least one factors that it's uh, compare uh, to 181 Mercer Street. Those are the green uh, uh, highlighted uh, boxes, which uh, which is uh, similar to the 181 Mercer. Uh, then we narrowed down the list further to uh, six buildings that we actually uh, dig deep into. Uh, that we uh, we eventually compared them to uh, the 181 uh, Mercer Street, and here we have the uh, the six buildings, uh, which is uh, Two Court Square, uh, Poi Tower in Brooklyn, uh, and uh, the Brookfield Place um, in Lower Manhattan. BNY Mellon uh, in Lower Manhattan as well, and then the CUNY Science Center and the Center of the Discovery and Innovation here at uh, CCNY. Yeah, pass it to John. For our project, the main hypothesis or research question was if the inclusion of bird safe glass on 181's Mercer's initial design is an effective deterrent on avian window collisions. And we predicted that the implementation would would uh, result in that there would be less collisions to, compared to other high risk buildings that are being monitored by uh, NYC Audubon. So the purpose of our project is to try to prevent avian coll collisions on glass. So now into methods. So for our methods in our project, we monitored uh, 181 Mercer during two points throughout the year. Spring, we monitored for between uh, May 15th to May 29th because we were still working on our project at the time because it was before the mid-year. We, we kind of didn't hit the migratory period of the birds uh, flying through the building. So it was a less of a, it was a smaller migration uh, like monitoring of the building. But in fall, we actually went from September 15th to November 1st and we followed the project safe flight uh, protocols by arriving between 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. We walked one lap around the building. We recorded the time, the temperature, the number of birds, and the species that was found, if there was a bird found, and what side of the building the bird collided on. 
The image on that you see right there is one of the birds we found that collided with the 181 Mercer. And from our methods, the, we found that despite the building is bird safe, there is actual collisions with the buildings because we found four birds that collided with the building. Two uh, were on the north side, one was on the southwest side, and uh, the fourth one was on the south side. Where and different uh, and different uh, we have a map showing of where they collided on the building, uh, perspective to the environment it is in. And one of the birds that hit it hit at this spot right here on the northeast side. Uh, on the south side of 181 Mercer, one bird that the bird a bird collided with the glass here. And on the southwest side, another bird was found here. Uh, here we have the uh, uh, five built, uh, five uh, actually six buildings that uh, we finally selected to compare to 181 Mercer. Uh, it shows the uh, the bird strikes and as well as the uh, the buildings along with the uh, 181 Mercer feed. Uh, so, uh, based upon the result, uh, the uh, we found that the glass on 181 Mercer does not sufficiently proven that uh, it is it prevents the 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 bird collision uh, 100 percent. And then, um, compared to those uh, five buildings, the comparable buildings, uh, the result were in in exclusive and exclusive because our comparable building had a similar collision rate to. The, uh, the, bu the building uh, that we monitor, which is 181. Um, therefore, reassessment and more research uh, are needed to design a better and more effective methods, and also an architectural innovations and improvement of existing buildings are needed to promote a more uh, sustainable uh, coexistence among the wildlife and then the, uh, the urban development. So limitations to the, our capstone were the, the there's only three of us and we had a limited time to monitor because we couldn't monitor like if New York City out of bombers got monitor they have like a huge group of people so they have a wider area and time to actually monitor so we had a limited time uh 181 Mercer is a unique architectural building so finding a comparable site was difficult and there were certain uh, victim challenges that we had to contend with, such as predation of birds being uh, another, a cat eating a bird. We couldn't really monitor that. Uh, janitors got there before we did, because sometimes I would get there to the site and the janitor was already there. So we couldn't do nothing about that. Or if a bird fell on a, an awning or on the green roof or on any part of the building, because there's a lot of like protrusions that stick out, so if the bird falls in an inaccessible place, we can't actually document if anything occurred. All right, so I'll go quick. Um, the next steps is, as mentioned earlier, is to expand number of buildings, get more people to assist with monitoring, look at other factors, vegetation, lights, water, use of building, number of people to figure out why there are collisions. Um, and then, work with the public and private groups to ensure bird-friendly practices and support more bird-friendly policies. But you might think, well, this is interesting, but why should I care? Uh, one, birds are living things and we have a right to live, they should have a right to live. Uh, they're also culturally important that we pass down what we have to our children. These are Eastern Bluebirds, which are the state's bird of New York. Um, birds eat pesticides, which like mosquitoes and can help mitigate diseases, also less chemicals, which is better for us. And then um, go into mental and physical health on the next slide. So birding, uh, bird watching is a hundred billion dollar a year industry. So there's actually economic values to saving birds. They eat insects and other pests to save crops including some of your favorite drinks like wine and coffee, just saying. Um, less pesticides is better for our health. It shows that um, birds 
that people who go bird walking and go into green areas like bird habitat tend to be less stressed and have better overall physical health or getting more exercise. And they say bird, uh, bird friendly habitats can save you up to $32,000 on property values and can save you on ecosystem services such as seed dispersal, pollination, all sorts of things. Birds are cool. So you're thinking, well, birds are cool. And now I realize they're important. So what can I do? Basically, turn off your lights, retrofit your windows, educate friends and neighbors, and uh, help them do that too. Remove plants from your windows. If you find a bird, report it onto DBird, which is Audubon's database for collisions. So they know where the birds are hitting and how often. And then if you find a bird that is still living, take it to Wild Bird Fund to get rehabbed. And then support um, bird-friendly legislation. So getting into bird-friendly legislation, um, Francisco Moya just introduced intro 1039 and we're trying to get it passed. So what you can do is you can go sign the petition on Audubon's website. You can call your council member, you can go to Wild Bird Fund and sign a postcard and we'll send it. So basically what it does is it prohibits um, any excess or unnecessary lights in private um, or in private owned buildings. Um, the exceptions are buildings for night security, are lights that are there for um, safety for any reason. And then before we go, we just want to give a special thank you to some people. Catherine Silverman for being an awesome advisor. Catherine Chen for giving us the uh, PSF data and the DBIRD data to make this possible. Kieran Timberlake for giving us all that wonderful information about um, 181 Mercer, Wild Bird Fund for helping all those collision victims, and Walker for providing those glass samples for us. So we will take questions. I would say most of the question I have a, um, a comment. I think uh, I work with the city, with the Department of Environmental Protection, and we have incorporated this into our design as one of the regulations that um, we check on because we consider it's important as part of the sustainability. So we do care. Uh, and I feel like it's important to consider all these items within the design. So I'm just wondering. With these, uh, you know, the local 94, 2019, that requires you to either install a green roof or solar panels. Um, since they've been attracted by, by green roof, we've added more green roof, which has a lot of benefits, right? But this is the key part of the effect. It's important, it improves the biodiversity. Um, but if we add it to these buildings without considering the glass friendly, very friendly uh, exterior glazing material, it will cost more of this. But, Obviously, mm -hmm. you have to consider that. It's, it's yeah, it's kind of a give and take. Um, I was always told when you have bird feeders, even like, you know, because you have the ones that stick to windows, is to always bird friendly your glass. Because when birds come into the bird feeder, they might miscalculate the perch onto the bird feeder and they might collide with the window. That's so um, if you looked at Mercer, you know, it had that green roof and it had like that another really tall structure. Yeah. So there are, you know, there are things to consider. I know Javits Center has bird friendly design and they have a this like most amazing green roof. And I think their collisions have gone down. So like way down since they did that. I can't remember when they did it or the numbers, but. Yeah, but definitely it's important to incorporate all these criteria within the design so you're creating a project. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and just because our results were a little bit inconclusive doesn't mean like other studies were. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think you mentioned this already, but the Mercer building that you looked at, was that one of the buildings that had to comply with Local Law 15? So, before? yeah, so Local Law 15 was uh, passed in, I think, January 2021. So I, it was enacted before it, but I think it was kind of one of those we know it's going to be passed, so we might as well just, you know, like kick off. The thing with laws like Local Law 15 is because building in New York and policy and stuff are so slow, it just takes a while to like start catching up and stuff with stuff like that. So 
I think NYU was, they knew it was coming. So they just decided to just, oh, we're redesigning, rebuilding this building anyway. And this is coming down the pipeline. We'll just incorporate it or design now. How can I bird proof my glass? I live in a, in a, a woodland and I, once in a while I hear a bird thump on the glass. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, um, if you get... Yeah, I'm in a single family home. Yeah, so you're not in the New York situation where I live in an apartment. Yeah. Um, and one of the birds did sadly fatally hit one of the windows in my apartment. So that was like one of those talking to like the super and the management to, you know, try to convince them to start with bird friendly materials. If you live on your own, um, they do sell like decals that you can stick on the outside of your window. And I do emphasize put it on the outside of the window because it makes it more visible than if you put it on the inside of the window based on the reflectivity of the glass. So um, American Bird Conservancy has a really good list of methods and the effectiveness and I think the costs and they're like really on top of it. So they're probably the best resource to go to see what works best for your windows, I would say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there chat questions or am I just? There may be. I don't know if those were old, they're new. The chat, I think, is new. Can you pull it up there? Oh, that, that is one of the questions. Uh, that's one of my uh, it's one of my friends I went to the Smithsonian Mason School of Conservation with. <laughs> Click on Q and A and see. <laughs> Thanks, Tabitha. <laughs> I think that's for older. Yeah. Scroll down. There might be a newer question. Oh yeah. Uh, no, nothing new there. Okay. <laughs> Super. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, another successful series of presentations. Come up and see the glass samples if you have a chance before you head out. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just not by wild bird, but any, any, list of, you don't care how you do it, but whatever we do, can you to get 1039 dollars